Okay, terrific. Um, now we we have time for our grower panel. Uh, thanks so much, Eric. That was the videos were both fantastic, and the information that you shared. I love your um, don't give up <laughs> because I know that's true of you. Look at how long you've been doing this, and I, it's also true of the two growers on the panel here. They're both um, people that I've heard talk about this. Um, as well as other practices, but but this practice alone, and it's something that they've worked on. They don't expect it to always work the first time, and they keep refining it and working at it until it does happen. So I would like to introduce, Laura will be um, guiding the panel in the Q&A, um, and on the panel are Roy Fuentes and Javier Zamora. Roy is the president of Fuentes Berry Farms, his agricultural heritage traces back to his grandfather who came to work um, in the fields under the Bracero program. Uh, Fuentes Berry Farms um, leases 135 acres, specializes in strawberries and raspberries, and um, employs over 100 workers. So thank you so much, um, Roy. Please correct anything I misstated there. Mm -hmm. And Javier Zamora is the owner of JS, the JSM Organic mm -hmm. Brand and Triple M Ranch in Royal Oaks. He farms over 100 acres on California's central coast. Um, he studied at Cabrillo College in Alba and is now a mentor to other farmers as well as a leading voice in organic production. He participates on many boards, including EcoFarm and CCOF. He grows strawberries, cane berries, vegetables, and um, beautiful flowers. Thank you, Javier, for being here. With that, welcome, I'll turn Pam. it over to you. <laughs> so, to you, Laura. Thank you, Pam. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Murphy with the RCD of Monterey County, and it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to chat with our farmers here about their experience with this practice. Uh, we have about 15 minutes to go through these questions and then for audience questions, I think we'll be having a discussion at the end. So these are just some directed questions for both of you, Javier and Roy. Um, in general, from your experience, what benefits have you gained from cover cropping in strawberry furrows? And thinking about those benefits, were they very valuable to you and your business, the environment and the broader community? Roy, how are you? Take it away, Roy. <laughs> well, um, it's it's been uh, uh, really good for me in my operation that I have uh, participated with Eric in regards to some of these, um, um, uh, you know, things that we've been, you know, working out through the years, and and for me. Uh, I'm a go-getter on cover crops, just, you know, overall. And um, uh, when when he came in and told me about uh, trying to do some of the furrows because of, you know, the ag order coming in and, you know, having to do something with the erosion, I said, yeah, let's, let's try it. And, and you know, uh, since we started it, uh, we started to see some really, really good um, values. And of course, one of them is what the ag order, you know, wanted to do, which was somehow, you know, start working on the water runoff, you know, and eventually, you know, control some of the erosion um, uh, that we get with that. And, and, you know, definitely working on different grounds, you, you have, different uh, results. Uh, if you're dealing like what the type of soil we're dealing at the USDA, DG ground, um, we tend to have more water runoff a lot quicker versus some of the fields that, that you know, are heavy soil, heavy clay that tend to retain, you know, or absorb quick, quicker uh, the water. But but it's, it's been great and we've been, um, um, you know, retaining uh, quite a bit of this rainwater, you know, coming. I know lately hasn't been the case because it hasn't, has not been raining, but the years 
that were, we noticed that the majority of the water will stay in the furrow and then eventually, um, you know, kind of uh, sink into the soil. And um, uh, we noticed that the erosion was very slow coming out and very clear water coming out. And it was, you know, less, um, less than versus if you didn't have the, um, the cover crop and the, and the furrow. So that's, that's a great value, you know, coming, um, you know, by, by doing this. Also the weeding. Weeding has been the biggest issue with us orga organic and it's always on a yearly thing that we have to, um, you know, spend so much money on it. So by doing this cover crop, you also gain value of, uh, of weed control. And, and that's a big plus for me. That's why I, you know, definitely, you know, uh, continue with, with the program. But, Excellent. Uh, That's really interesting, Roy, because I think, as I understand it, you are farming on relatively flat ground, and yet you've seen a very big benefit with erosion control. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, that's that's true. That's uh, how we've seen it, uh, you know, through the years. Uh -huh. Great, thank you. Javier, uh, can you talk about the benefits you've experienced? Uh, uh, absolutely, and, and please uh, get the hook if I'm going more than two minutes, because I know there's a couple other questions and we want to get to those. <laughs> Uh, to me, the number one thing is just because I don't, I don't farm on flat land for strawberries. I flat, I mean, I farm on hills. So erosion control was the number one benefit that I got out of this. Uh, it, it uh, it's really difficult to when you are farming uh, on rolling hills like I do, especially for strawberries. So the uh, the cover crop that I use, the uh, Ida Gold mustard, it worked really really well. Uh, it helped me control the uh, the speed of water coming on the hill, and uh, also helped me uh, uh, kind of like be a little bit of a um, uh, an educator when it comes to bringing out to the farmers market and offering it to people so they could you know saute with it as well and and it's edible. Uh, so that worked out really well. Uh, I would like to say though that. I use the Ida Gold like in the middle of the furrow, but at the end of the furrow, at the beginning and the end, I, I use um, rye grass. Because we know that, I mean, if you do three, four feet of rye grass at the end of the furrow where the water uh, comes in and goes out, it also helps you retain some of the sand that you might be losing. So uh, erosion control was the number one and also a uh, bringing something new during winter time for the customers to eat and saute with their garlic in winter time. That's excellent, mm -hmm. Javier. I think that's an unexpected benefit that this provided a <laughs> diversification of your marketable crops. Um, so you've both of you started to touch on some difficulties, some challenges perhaps, but if you could, with the next question, elaborate on the issues that you have faced in terms of implementing and managing this practice. What have been your greatest challenges? Um, what are some innovative ways that you've addressed them? And what are your next steps for addressing challenges as you continue? So Roy, I'll go, I'll go first this time. How about okay, that? Okay, go. <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, the first challenge that I had, it was how to irrigate it. Uh, I believe that, you know, if you want to do it really early on, you, got, you have to have the land available so you can plant early. And then you have to uh, lay another, another drip tape. So that's an extra cost. Uh, and then how do you, when do you get rid of it, right? That's, that's a little bit of a challenge because if, if it doesn't rain and if it rains too much and that kind of thing. The other challenge that I found was that uh, Idaho mustard grows really fast. It's beautiful. But if you don't get to it and if you don't trim it, you know, maybe in, let's see, I, I think it was December. It would actually start shading your strawberry plants. And in a certain area, I couldn't get to it because it was the, 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 uh, the area of the field that had the highest slope. And I didn't really want to get into it because... I would probably create a lot of erosion if we started walking on it and stuff. 
So that area, I, I, I wasn't able to trim it and cut it down early enough. So that a specific area, my strawberries got really leggy because they've been shaded uh, by the mustard. So the challenge was when to trim it, not at the end, but during the growing, uh, during the winter time when it's growing. So if we get a lot of sunny days, it grows really, really fast. So with, uh, the, to avoid that, I think uh, uh, Laura and I, uh, we're thinking about maybe planting something else that does not grow higher than a foot or 18 inches, something like that. So again, it's a, it's a little more challenging for me because of the rolling hills. You know, if I had a, a, a flat piece of ground like you guys do in Salinas, I mean, chances are I'll probably make it not as look as beautiful, not as beautiful as you guys had it, but a little more easier for us. And also to use the implements to, to cut it, to trim it down. Adelante, Roy. Go ahead, Roy. I, I, I agree with, uh, with, with what you said. Um, uh, what we faced, you know, through the years was we didn't have problems on growing it. It was how we were going to, you know, knock it down at what time and, and what tools to use. So, you know, we, we started um, uh, with uh, using, using La Rosadera, you know, the one to, to uh, bring it down. Uh, and then, you know, we found out exactly what you commented that if we let it grow too big, it was going to be uh, a disaster on, 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 you know, chopping it in. But um, then, you know, through the years, we decided to come in and, you know, chop it at a certain height where we could, we could have um, uh, uh, basically a better time when the rains went out and then we can start, you know, cultivating um, inside and, you know, a much easier way to uh, uh, get rid of it. But um, it's, it, it was a challenge, you know, that, that we had to do. And, and, and I think Eric and I, we've been, you know, trying to move a little more mechanically uh when the time comes and and then also playing with a different uh different master that that is not gonna grow you know like ira gold does uh and and that's 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 been that's been our case um uh, on how you know we we can chop it work it and incorporate it to the soil um so little by little we're penciling it in and that way that way it comes a, a much easier practice to do yeah i agree with you you have different challenges with the rolling hills uh, over here myself it, i get a little easier time to do that but but it's 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 working out so far thanks Roy. so i'm i'm gonna um riff a little bit and add an extra question here because we didn't really discuss the scale at which both of you are implementing this practice. I think we all understand Roy has the great advantage of working together with Eric and maybe a little bit of extra experimentation um, happening there. But mm -hmm. I think you're both using this practice in organic strawberries. That's one thing to note that's important. And um, what what scale, how many acres are you actually implementing this practice on every year? And are you mostly managing it with individual labor, hand tools, um, or are you using tractors and special implements? So uh, that year that I did the, uh, the, uh, the Ida Gold, we did 16 acres. We planted 16 acres. We did it all by hand. And like Roy was saying, we did use the, uh, the uh, Rosadera, you know, to during the season, during the uh, winter season, to chop certain areas down, the area that was growing a lot. Um, at the end of the season, we were actually a, we were able to use the uh, the uh, trimmer, the uh, wire eater, uh, or the weed eater. Um, but we had to be really careful because, again, you're not going to be able to use a tractor at that that time of the year at least in my area. Again, mm -hmm. it's rolling hills, it's, it's difficult. Uh, some areas are a little muddy and uh, like heavy soils. 
so you can't really get in. And some other areas might be sandy, but it's it's way up on the hill, so you can't drive the tractor. So what we did, we we used a a, a wire uh, trimmer, but we cut it small, not the normal width that you would use it with. That way, we avoid uh, hitting the plastic because. Uh, I mean, if you're just beginning, you haven't even harvested a single strawberry. And if you damage the plastic, the molds, you're toasted, my friend. So that will create so many problems. So uh, this is what I like uh, when I when I see the, the tools that Roy and, and Eric are creating. It makes me a lot happier uh, because I'll be able to use some of those tools versus just uh, trying to figure it out myself. So um, thank you for doing that. Roy, would you have anything to add? <laughs> um, uh, just to, um, you know, every year I'm increasing my plant. As we know, we do uh, all the acreage there at the USDA. My other mm -hmm. ranch, uh, you know, I started it with uh, with six acres and just kind of a point in where, where uh, most of the water runoff, I felt it, 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 it was going to, you know, definitely ease, you know, the water coming out. So every year I'm adding a few acres more and a few acres more, and then once we, um, you know, get 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 the tool that it's gonna help us to speed up the process of uh, of uh, you know doing the cuttings on the um, on on the uh, master, then then we can easily come in and increment you know our our, our acres. Uh, so uh, this year I'm. You know, thinking about doing about uh, twelve acres total, uh, and 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 with the uh, the USDA, so roughly doing about sixteen, you know, sixteen to eighteen acres a year, and 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 moving up. That sounds great. All right, we have just a couple minutes left, and to wrap up this section, I'd like to ask you. In the end, why, what is your reasoning? What is your motivation to do this practice, to continue with this practice, despite obvious challenges? And would you recommend it to other farmers? Any critical advice that you would give? Uh, absolutely. Why do I do it? It's just because we have to make sure that we don't lose any soil, that we keep the soil in place, um, because otherwise, well, your, your, your land will be, uh, having some issues because you don't just lose the soil, you lose a lot of nutrients as well, the root system, and you, I mean, you can figure that one out. So we don't want the soil to go with the neighbors. Uh, we do it because we need to make sure that we catch as much water as possible. And when you use cover crop, the water infiltrates and eventually will we'll get to the aquifers uh, faster. It would do it that way. And I guess it's just as an organic grower, the, the practices, the more practices you do that will help the environment, the better off you're gonna be during the growing season and the better, the better soil and better nutrients and better and water will be available for future generations that will, will likely be using the land that we're farming right now. Do I recommend it? Yes, I think mm -hmm. anyone that is an organic grower uh, should and must do some sort of cover crop. It's excellent if you can do it during summertime, if you have the land to do it, but it's definitely needed during the winter time because it can get really rainy sometimes. Not every year, but when it, when it rains, it pours and then we lose a lot of soil. ¿Qué le parece, señor Roy? Oh, you nail it in the head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's, it's, that's exactly why I'm, I'm, I'm doing it and learning from it. Uh, and I, I feel strongly that, you know, or, uh, if you're, you know, an organic farmer, you should definitely try uh, you know, all these applications that we are, are uh, you know, uh, trying and, and, and it'll be a great benefit, uh, uh, you know, for them. So I definitely recommend them. 
uh, you know, I'm an old fashioned type of uh, organic, uh, you know, going back to the late uh, Miguel Cantizano and, and some other, uh, other people that this is, is stressed to me that in organic, you got to take care of your land. You got to take care of your surroundings and, and all of this. So I think, uh, what, what we are, uh, doing uh, up to this point is basically achieve that particular goal, but it's, it's not, it's not, you know, done yet. We still need to, you know, keep learning and then having, having uh, people like Eric uh, definitely giving ideas and all of this. It's just, it's just been, been, been really good. Um, and, and it's something for every, everyone uh, you know, to try and learn from it. Thank you both very much. It's always nice to wrap up on a positive and inspired, motivating note. Please, both of you stick around so that at the end, we can have some audience questions with you. And Pam, would you like to move on with the agenda? Yes, <clears throat> thank you so much. That was really valuable information. Uh, it's just so great to hear firsthand from somebody who has tried the practice and and um, and made it work and, and kept working with it. So really appreciate your sharing your knowledge and experience with us.